I'm so glad to be joining with you today. Uh, I was asked by Steve to uh, do a session on taking courage and engaging our culture. I teach a PhD seminar in biblical theology and culture, and I was wondering how I could get all of that scrunched down into 30 minutes. Um, didn't quite figure all of that out right, but what I want us to do today is I want us to think through biblically what the scripture teaches us about engaging our culture. I want you to think back with me what it might have been like around the year 200, all right? 200, go all the way back as far as you could think. Maybe you've been to the Mediterranean and maybe you've gone to like Greece or Turkey or Israel and maybe you can kind of picture what that's like. Around the year 200 in a town called Carthage, which is in modern day Tunisia, the town of Tunis now, there was a pastor. His name was Tertullian. You might remember Tertullian from your church history class uh, that you took at some point because he had that very famous quote that often gets tossed around where he said, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. You may, may ring a bell there, Tertullian. That's, that's who that pastor was. The blood of the martyrs is a seed of the church. Tertullian was a pastor in a town where he's watching his young men his young women, his older men, and older women in his church regularly be arrested, regularly be placed in front of uh, some sort of tribunal, and regularly go to their death for Jesus Christ in an arena in front of thousands of other people, an arena that still stands today. Can you imagine pastoring in a context or a culture that hostile to Christianity. Some of you do know what that's like because you serve on a mission field where that is how hostile it is to the gospel. But for those of us in the United States, we've never experienced anything like that. I know that the last few years have been very destabilizing as we've seen difficulties and issues and ideas and concepts about how we deal with a pandemic. But Tertullian also got to deal with the exact same thing. <laughs> he had to deal with pandemic in his own day and time. So I think it's helpful for us to look back to some of the early church and to see what they are dealing with. Now, Tertullian, despite the fact that uh, he is in this oppressive environment, he also begins to help his church and others understand Christianity. And so to make a defense for Christianity, he wrote a work called An Apology. An apology in a philosophical framework simply means a defense of the faith. It's not an I'm sorry. It, it's a defense of the faith. And in the first chapter of this work, and right at the beginning of his apology, he makes an interesting claim he makes a claim that the reason why he's having to give a defense for his faith and for the faith of his church is because the external world, the Roman Empire, wasn't understanding what was going on. Listen to this claim from him. The outcry is that the state is filled with Christians, that they are in the fields, in the citadels, in the islands, Non-believers make lamentation like this is a calamity, that both men and women, every age and condition, even high rank, are passing over to the profession of the Christian faith. Despite the hostile environment, Tertullian is making it very, very clear that while they are engaging their hostile environment, people are still coming to faith in Christ. And it's the poor, it's the wealthy, it's the powerful, those who are in the citadels, those who are working in the government, it's those who are separated even from the cities, those who are working in the fields. It's all of these individuals from all walks of life who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and consequently, those in power are beginning to wring their hands and say, this is a problem that so many people are becoming Christians. Now, would that be a claim for our own day and time? Would that be something that we would experience in our own lifetimes, that the outcry is so many people are becoming Christians, we don't know what's going on? 
There's a sociologist, his name is Rodney Stark. He teaches at Baylor University uh, in his retirement. He was a, an atheist, and when he began to study how on earth does Christianity go from just a few people localized in this outcast region of the Roman Empire suddenly become the dominant religion by the year 300, he's so convicted by what he sees, he abandons his atheism and begins to pursue Christ. The evidence is overwhelming that the early church, no matter what they faced, no matter what they experienced, that God continued to work through them to change the world for Jesus Christ. Now, I know that's what we want to see in our own day and time. When we talk about cultural engagement, we talk about this often in terms of methods and practices and other kinds of things. But before we get to some of that, I want us to step back and I want us to understand what the scripture says. For those Young men and young women, those older men and older women that went to the arena in Tertullian's day, when they were placed in the middle of the arena, they were given the opportunity to recant. Will you denounce Jesus? Over and over, according to the records that we have that have survived from that time period, the answer was overwhelmingly, Jesus is Lord. So friends, I want us to start our conversation by making sure that we understand one thing very clearly. Jesus is Lord. No matter what pandemic comes, no matter what mandate comes, no matter what changes, Jesus is Lord. And we need to take comfort and security and also courage because if Jesus is Lord, we have nothing to worry about. Our life and times are in his hands and we can boldly engage no matter what because Jesus is Lord. In fact, I want you to take your Bible out and I want us to look at a few ways that we need to think through engaging what we call culture and what we're going to see in that time. I want you to turn to the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul writing to the church in Colossae, he's kind of drawing everything together and he's pulling it all together in this one little section in the final conclusion. And he's given the church in Colossae a very clear instruction that it's easy for us to read over or to miss because it's kind of in the, the, those personal addresses and other kinds of things. But look at verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Paul, writing to the church, is helping them understand that you need to understand the significance of your time. Now, if you serve and work in the United States, I think you've caught on by now that we are in an odd time of shifting values and a shifting broader culture. We need to understand the times in which we live. But notice the instruction from Scripture here for us. It's not to withdraw. It's actually to continue to engage graciously, seasoned with salt, that framework of understanding that we share the gospel consistently so that we can answer each person. Listen to a parallel in Ephesians chapter 5. When you turn there, just a few pages over. We're told in 5.15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. Friends, we are engaging in a day and a time unlike any other, but it's also like every other time in the sense that, again, Jesus is Lord And our commission stays and remains the same. Our times may change, but the message does not. So we continue to engage. 
One of my students uh, from years past had talked about it this way. If you're a musician, he's like, you can take a song and you can change the key of the song, but the tune itself, uh, the structures of the pieces that are there stay consistent. The key can change, but the structural pieces stay the same. That's what we need to do when we're looking at our culture is we engage with the truth and unchanging gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus alone saves. And we do not compromise that. But at the same time, we may need to sing in a little bit of a different accent to help ears be able to hear whether you're in Texas or Missouri or Colorado or maybe in South America or wherever God has placed you. So we know our times, that that they are pressing against the things of God, but that does not change our mission. Now, friends, we all memorized the Great Commission, right? We all know Matthew 28 so well. It's part of uh, of what we do. It's, It's an understanding of this. But so many times I find pastors, especially when we are discouraged and when we have lost sight of what's going on, that we forget verse 18. You have your Bible, turn to Matthew 28, right? Jesus, as he's brought all of his disciples to Galilee, when Jesus sees them, uh, when Jesus is there with them, verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, right? Where's the power for our engagement? Our authority for engagement comes from Jesus. All authority has been given to me. Jesus says, go therefore. The authority comes first from the Savior. So friends, if you have been commissioned by the Savior himself, let us not then shrink back. We're going to go and engage the work that God has set out for us. All authority has been given to me. That authority is the authority that we have to then notice what it says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And then we're promised his presence. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is so simple and so elementary, and we teach this to our kids. But in your own ministry, have you forgotten That the authority comes from Jesus himself. And that we need to go. Notice too that it says that as we make disciples, right? We're baptizing them. We're winning people to Christ. But we're also discipling them, right? We're teaching them everything that Jesus has commanded. And may I give you a caution. It is easy to draw a crowd spouting off about different political theories or ideals or commentary on the day or the newspaper or whatever. But friends, we're not told to tell that message. We're told to give them the word. Give them the word. Evaluate your preaching. Evaluate the pulpit ministry of your congregation. Are people receiving the word of God? One of the things I love about my church is that that's what my pastors focus on, is preaching the word of God. That should be the preeminent ministry marker for your congregation, that the word of God is clearly preached. Preach the word in season, out of season. Brother pastors, that has to be the key of our ministry, is preaching the word. So we go teaching, discipling, all under the authority of Jesus Christ. But if we flip over to Acts chapter 1, when Jesus is giving his final words to his disciples, they're concerned. They're asking Jesus, is this the end? Is this how you're going to bring all this together? And he, he cautions them in Acts 1-7 that they shouldn't worry themselves about times or seasons when Jesus is going to come back. Instead, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses 
Where? In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. So not only do we have an authority given to us by the Savior, we have power for the mission given from the Holy Spirit. Power for the mission given by the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I know that some of our charismatic friends may, may take some of this aspect too far in terms of their pneumatology, but I want us to not forget that Paul in Romans 8 says, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead abides in you. Friends, that same power of the Holy Spirit is in you and in your ministry if you will take the commission given to you in the authority of Jesus Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit to engage your cultural moment. Don't shrink back in fear. It's fascinating when you read, especially in 2 Timothy, that seems to be the challenge that Timothy is having, is that he's pulling back. He's intimidated by what's going on. And Paul reminds him that that same power of the Holy Spirit is there in 2 Timothy 1. Read it. He keeps telling Timothy, don't pull back. Don't shy away. Continue to share the hope of Jesus. Own your mission. Live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I want us to understand, if we've got the authority and we have the power, where does this work itself out? And I want you to turn back to Ephesians again. I'll never forget the moment as a pastor. I, I was in my own personal study and I, I was working through Ephesians. And this was one of those texts that just all of a sudden the Holy Spirit brought to light. I'm sure you've had those moments in your own ministry and life where, where God just brings something in such sharp relief. And after years of, uh, of studying the word and even preaching through the book of Ephesians, somehow I had never seen this. And I don't want us to miss this. In Ephesians 3, starting in verse 7, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. Amen, right? That's, that's our job, pastors, uh, uh, to walk in this. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That is our delight. That is our joy to preach Christ. We all have our own weaknesses, we all have our own challenges, but this is what God has given us to do. That it's his calling on our lives. But that thought continues. And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. If you study the book of Ephesians, that mystery is quite simply that all things are coming under the authority of Jesus. It's basically the proclamation that Jesus is Lord. Verse 10, and this is what just popped off the page. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. God's design has always been the church. Now, I don't know how messy your church is. But God's design has always been to receive glory through his church. God's design has always been that the church is an outpost of the kingdom of God. God's design has always been that when people come in contact with the local church, that there is something so unbelievably unlike anything else in this world that people cannot escape the truth that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Why else do all these people gather together? Why do you have people from low socioeconomic status and high economic status? Why do you have people with power and people with none? Why do you have people who have brown skin and people with white skin? And why do you have people who are all together here? There is no reason for us to gather in this place. And so the world goes, what are they doing? And our only answer, Jesus is Lord. Right? That's why our church communities must work, and as a pastor, we must work to try to help our congregations live and love in Christ. There's a brilliant book by Jonathan Lehman, The Church and the Surprising Offense of God's Love that I would strongly recommend, that talks about how important things like church discipline are in our churches, how important it is to take seriously the membership covenant between members so that we can love and show Jesus consistently across the board. 
These are concepts we have to work through. Our ecclesiology matters because it's through the church. And did you notice who that proclamation is made to? It's not to your mayor. It's not to your senator. It's not to the president of the United States. Look at the text. Made known to rulers and authorities and the heavenly places. Paul is using this as spiritual warfare language. Now again, talk to your missionaries. Sometimes in the West, we're pretty fast to dismiss the realm that's beyond the seen realm here. But it's real. There are demons. There is a devil. And they are working to distract people from the claims of Jesus Christ. And did you notice through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to who? to those rulers and authorities in heavenly places. When we gather as the church, we are declaring war against the evil one. Do you want to know why there's such turmoil and fighting in your church? It's because if I'm the evil one, the place that I want to attack most is the place that weekly in its gathering is declaring that Jesus is Lord. Why would I want to just leave this alone? I would be doing everything I can to insert all kinds of conflict, gossip, issues, sexual immorality, anything I could do to discredit the local church. Because if I could discredit the local church, they're not screaming the gospel week in, week out, week in, week out. Friends, you want to know why your church is under attack? It's that. Your gathering of your church matters. It is through the church that this is made known. And notice in verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have, what? Boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Friends, the church is God's plan for us to engage the culture because that is where he wants to see all of this work. So in the process of this, I I have what I like to call the arc of the gospel for us to be able to see and connect and and to be able to understand how this works. And all of us have this moment, this story where you and I were transformed by the gospel. We heard the good news and the Holy Spirit drew on our hearts and we responded in faith and we trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And that transformation was dynamic. We may not have realized that I was six. I had no clue exactly what God was doing. But man, am I so thankful. So thankful for those who faithfully shared the gospel. My whole family are believers because of a bus barn worker who was working with my grandfather who had severe dyslexia and didn't know how to read. And so they didn't know what to do with him back in those days. So they sent him out to the bus barn. And he was a godly man who just shared the gospel with my grandfather. And he trusted Christ. This type of transformation echoes through eternity. One person coming to faith, transformed by Jesus Christ. But the hope that we have in the word, that Jesus even said to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. Right? He gives us the Holy Spirit and he places us into the church community where we are part of the body of Christ. Now let's stop and think about that for a moment. If I were God, I think I might have done it differently, right? That it's maybe through some sort of famous preacher, a a Billy Graham or or something like that, that that's where all of the energy of declaring the gospel is is going forward. Maybe it would be some other way that we would see some sort of epiphany in the sky or, or some other kind of thing. But no, God in his infinite wisdom chose to place each of us as flawed but redeemed sinners into community together so that we could reflect the goodness of Jesus Christ. It's through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known, the transformation of the individual is placed into the necessity of community. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. You cannot exist spiritually outside of the body of Christ. You cannot, 
I, I'm going to begin to question the nature of your salvation if you are not connected to a local church. It's just the way that God has wired us and designed us and put us together. And then what happens is, just as we read in that text, is that the church begins to show what? Christ. Which then presses into the life of each individual believer a continual gospel message. But it also commissions and sends out that particular person back and the cycle starts all over again. And so while the arc of the individual is towards eternity and spending eternity with our Lord and Savior to God be the glory. The reality is on the ground until that day that he calls us home. We continue to repeat this over and over, and the ark of salvation, this ark of the gospel, continues to move forward. Brother pastors, this is what we're about. That's why our idea of cultural engagement, where God may give us moments and time where we can intersect ourselves higher and higher in the stream of culture, and we can begin to see those things. And I'm, I'm so thankful when God does give those moments and windows. At the end of the day, the number one way of cultural transformation according to the word of God is simply faithfulness in your local church. Your church matters. And I know it may be a messy place, and you may be saying, you don't know all of the mess that's in my congregation. I get it, but it doesn't change the word of God. Now, here's the challenge. For many of us, we see this and we go, okay, I, I can understand this intellectually. But we're not willing to see this work out in reality. I want you to think back again to your, your history class. Do you remember the name William Carey? William Carey, the great missionary to India. Do you remember how long Carey ministered faithfully before he saw one convert? Does anyone remember? Seven years. Seven years. Seven years of riding back to England and saying, God is still good, no souls. Seven years of toiling, seven years of losing a wife, seven years of having to move because of political issues, seven years of running out of money, having to work in a factory, having to do all kinds of crazy things, seven years before one. Now, what did Kerry do in the midst of those seven years? Did he sit on his hands? Did he moan about that? He simply sat down and began to translate the word of God into the language of the people because he knew ultimately that the word of God was going to be the largest transformative force beyond anything else. Perhaps the challenge that most of us need in this room is simply to be faithful to what God has called us to do as pastors and leaders and as churches. If we would just get that right, instead of chasing after the latest thing, we might also begin to see God move. And it may be a season of dryness in your ministry, but don't lose heart. This is God's plan. It is God's plan to continue to move, to continue to work, to continue to see this. And we began to see the power of God working in and through his people for his glory. Now I want to show you this and kind of move this down into a very practical level for us, just as an idea. One of the things that I, I really struggle with, and, and again, in, in, in teaching for over 20 years and, and pastoring and, and being in ministry since the mid-90s, I've been to the conferences. I've been to those places where somebody wants to sell you a book on how to engage your culture and your day and your time. And, and we can be like those individuals who just keep surfing on every little wave that shows up. And our, our people end up getting whiplash back and forth because we're chasing this program and that program and we're doing this and that. And, and it's so frustrating for the people in the congregation because in our honest attempt to try to win the loss to Christ, we're chasing models and methods and we're not just allowing the simplicity of the word of God to stand forth. 
Let the word reverberate through your people. Let the word reverberate from the pulpit. And then you model what it is to go. In my pastorate, I, before I moved here to work at Midwestern, I served as a senior pastor uh, at Normandale Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We were on the west side of town. One of the things I led our, our staff and elder team to do is own our mission. Now, here's the great thing about the BBFI. You guys, we are incredibly passionate about seeing the gospel reach to the ends of the earth. And many of your churches regularly give above and beyond sacrificially to make sure that missionaries are equipped and supported all around the world. And to God be the glory. But some of you have forgotten that God has placed you as a missionary in your own community. When was the last time you did an analysis of your own community to even know how to missiologically engage the people who surround your church. One of the things we did was we took a huge map, pinned it on the wall in the church offices, and we just simply drew a one-mile radius circle around the location of the church. A one-mile radius around the location of the church. And we said, we are going to do everything we can to make sure that every single person in that one-mile radius at least has the opportunity to hear the gospel. That's a pretty big goal. You think about a mile, it's not that far. You can walk a mile. Some of you maybe even ran a mile this morning or more. But when you start drawing a full mile around your church congregation, depending on where you are, that could be a lot of streets, a lot of homes, and a lot of places that are very dark. So you take this and you begin to understand, if we start right here in this one mile radius, right around the church, we want everyone in that mile radius to know Jesus. We want them to know that our congregation is a place of hope. That if they're missing out on life or other kinds of things, when their divorce happens, they, they should know that this is a place to come for hope. When, when, when life, the rug gets taken out from underneath them, they should know this is a place for hope. That one mile radius and understanding what's there. What we did was we then began to pull information to find out about who was in our one mile radius. Right around the church, we had a lot of middle class kind of suburban homes. And my assumption as the pastor, well, that's who our community is. Lo and behold, when we did our study in the one mile radius around there, we found that 20% of the people didn't even speak English. They were Spanish speakers, so there was a miss. We found out that there was another 15% of that community who had never even finished high school. How does that change the way that you communicate things? We found out that as we started talking to those people, the fact that it was Dr. John Mark Yates, I, think I, I hate that little doctor, but that was a turnoff. It means they're not going to be able to understand what's happening on a Sunday morning. That was scrubbed off our sign very quickly. We did everything that we could to begin to reach into and strategize to reach into those pockets. Now, in America, for those of you who are working in the United States, where are the hubs of family connectivity now in the United States? There are really two arenas, sports and schools, sports and schools. Unless you're actively, personally engaged in the sports, those are harder to break into, but schools, man, they're overwhelmed the teachers are overworked, and they need help. In our one-mile radius, we had an elementary school. And by God's grace, we had a teacher in that elementary school in our congregation. And she just went to the principal and said, hey, our church wants to do something. How can we help? We found out, too, from our demographic work that one elementary school, 70%, I think it was like 72%, of the individuals in that, students in that school were on reduced meal plans. If you work with public schools, what that means is those kids are food insecure. So when we started talking with the principal, the principal said, we've got kids who leave on Friday and Friday lunch is their last meal until they come for breakfast on Monday. That's not okay. So how do we intersect? One of my senior adults who'd been a teacher before, she goes, I know how to fix this. And she organized our senior adults Again, I, I'm not doing this as, as lay people in our church, just hearing the need and finding a way to meet the need. 
being the church, and they started packing snack sacks. And every week, they would kind of form a line in our church hallway, our, our fellowship hall, and they would just sit and box up these little bags that had like instant mac and cheese and Vienna sausages and other kinds of things, uh, snacks and things for kids to be able to eat over the weekend. And then we gave them to the church or to the school and the school distributed them. We didn't put literature in it. We didn't do anything, but we just said, if you'll just, you know, let them know this is a gift from Normandale Baptist Church if you, if you can, because we didn't want to pin our principal uh, down too much. Within four months of doing that, the principal started coming to us. Hey, I've got a family who needs this. Can you guys help? Yes, we can. Hey, um, we've got a bunch of kids who would love to be able to play sports, but because there's so much economic disparity here, they can't afford to play uh, sports. Can you guys do something about it? Yeah, we can. They even allowed us to do basically an upward soccer on the school grounds for eight weeks, every fall and every spring, and we shared the gospel with kids there. If we'll just take opportunities to be the church in our community, friends, it just opens up doors. There's no program. It's just be the church. Be missionaries. Go to where the people are and reach them with the gospel. It's that simple. What sprung out of that, and by God's grace and faithfulness, we ended up planning a, a Spanish-speaking church. That church, uh, under their current pastor, has spun that off as an independent congregation. They now have uh, a, a church that, uh, that's working with them that's uh, a Somalian congregation because there was a huge wave of uh, refugees that came into that community, and they began to work with them, doing the same thing, just repeating the same process, and going and going from there. One mile radius, and we began to see Families come into our church building, a new church plant started, and God did all of that within a small amount of time. I think some of the things that keep us from engaging is either fear or we just think we can't and we've just missed what God wants. In that one mile radius, we also set out to say, you know what, because we want everyone to know, we're going to at least once a year, we ended up doing about twice a year, we went and knocked on every single one of those doors. I know door knocking is passe, but I mean, good night. At, at my house, I've got all kinds of people trying to sell me stuff in, in my neighborhood about every week. I, so I don't, I don't think, if it was the case that I didn't work, they wouldn't do that, right? That's a lot of manpower. So it works. Let's get out there. And so we just go to the streets and we would, we would equip small groups with um, a map and like 30 homes. And they would go for like an hour on a Saturday or a Tuesday night or whenever. And they would just kind of go down and they would just knock on the door. And if nobody answered, they just leave kind of a, a hanger on the door, just inviting them to the church to maybe an Easter or a, a series that we were going to do. And then uh, when we got to meet with someone, we would just say, hey, we're from Normandale Baptist Church. We just wanted to let you know that we're having this thing. We'd love to invite you. We'd love to have you, you come. And you usually end up with a conversation with them. And, and they say, hey, before we leave, can we pray with you? Is there anything we could pray with you about? People will spill their souls when you ask that question. And then we would pray with them. And inevitably, then, we would just say, hey, can you tell us your story about Jesus? Do you, do you, what do you know about Jesus? And we would get to share the hope of the gospel with that person. Friends, it's simple. There's, there's, there's all kinds of ways that your church, being the church in their community, can reach in and make a difference. We said that for our one-mile radius, we were going to own that. We then took a new circle and drew it around our three-mile radius and then around our five-mile radius. And what we said was in the five-mile radius, we wanted to own every school. We wanted to have a presence there of some way. Maybe it was just those snack sacks. Maybe it was something else. We would do something. In the three-mile radius, we wanted families to know that they could come to our church for different kinds of things. Maybe it was children's ministries, whatever we'd promote uh, in that kind of area. But one three, and five. By the time you got to our five-mile radius, it was 77,000 people. There's no way I can reach all of those. So we'll let the Holy Spirit do his work and we'll do whatever, but I can own the mission field that God has given me. And I'm wondering if we want to talk about cultural engagement, what would happen if out of the hundreds of churches represented here today, we just had churches know that Jesus is Lord, be willing to risk in the power of the Holy Spirit under the authority of the commission that came from our Savior, they would just be the church and love their neighbors and share Jesus verbally with them 
and then just see what God will do. Friends, it's not complicated. It's not. It's knowing your neighborhood and sharing Jesus. That's cultural engagement. And letting the Lord do what he wants to do in your congregation. Be transformative agents in your culture by just being the church. We have about nine minutes left. And I'm happy to answer any question uh, and to be able to talk with you uh, about some of these ideas. Uh, Again, my aim was just to encourage you that you have everything that you need to engage culture. You have everything that you need. The the reality of this too, if we want to study church history, (laughs) is that it doesn't always go easily. Sometimes that increases persecution, right? But if the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church, uh, actually that is cultural engagement in a different way. We just need to trust that Jesus is Lord and in his time and his season, he will do his work in his way. And praise God we get to be a part of it during this brief season of life that we're a part of. Can I answer someone's question in the next uh, eight minutes? Yes. It wasn't clear to me the specifics of the three mile and the five mile. What what is the difference? What we did with the three mile is we made sure that we had uh, all of the schools represented. We made sure that we we target mailed them direct mail pieces in the three mile, not in the five. Uh, We made sure that we kind of showed up at like events in the sport fields if they were doing like a 5K or something like that, those kinds of things. In the five mile radius, we just wanted to try to, we just tried to work with the schools was as far as we could kind of get with that. It was just too far, too much to handle. Our one mile was where it was at. And then we tried a little bit more targeted mailings and other kinds of things in in the three mile. That's a good question. Other questions? Yes. So I have an online and YouTube ministry. Yeah. Have you seen any great ways to take any influence there and kind of funnel that to people in local churches? Yeah, so that is actually the new frontier, right, is digitally engaging what's going on. I've got a couple of friends who are doing this in different ways. Um, I, I have a friend uh, here in town who is doing that, and he is using communities uh, built up in a couple of different platforms, uh, one amazingly in Minecraft, and actually creating worship environments there. And uh, he has a gathering every week of like 30 people, and he's seen people come to Christ. I, I, I can't explain it. I don't even know how to make the controller work, um, to be honest. Uh, but that, that's, that's what he does. I have another uh, former student who is in Oklahoma, and a church has hired him to, to work on this. He is a, um, a streamer, and he uses his streaming uh, of playing sports games prim- primarily uh, through Twitch and uh, also on Facebook Live. And then he uses that to share the gospel and then connects people as they comment back in and out to local churches. It's, it's hard because one of the things with that, and we, I think we have to be very cautious, right? So we've all gotten to do this fun experiment over the last 18 months, depending on where you were, about being digital, right? Um, that's not what many of us plan for. Um, I even have a book that I wrote a few years back uh, called Franchising McChurch where I actually say, don't do that. Um, I, I recant. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is part of what's there. Uh, we want to find ways to connect people to the truth of the gospel. I, I like to still think about them in ways that we might think of the explosion of radio ministries in the 40s, Right? The gospel was clearly proclaimed by these great preachers. The missing link was the local body. So we still want to connect people to a local body. Now, that's what I love about my friend who's using kind of Minecraft. And, and, and his, he's like, what, we're, what I'm doing is I'm church planning in a digital space. I, I still am kind of uncomfortable with it on some level. But at the same time, he's trying to replicate that with membership and other kinds of things in that digital space. And that's what his church is working with. Um, but we still need to connect them to the local church. Always. And, and that should be the case. Uh, Lord willing, you guys are still streaming, right? Lord willing, in your congregation, as you preach on Sunday, you're still streaming. We're seeing people access the gospel like never before. And 
go figure, right? In a culture that's so cynical, in a culture where you can get canceled for anything, in a culture where uh, there's so much destabilization, we're not the only ones who feel that. Everybody else does too. And yet they flip through whatever and suddenly they're getting fed something from your local church and they hear that Jesus is Lord, they hear that Jesus is hope, and suddenly we've got people coming to faith in Christ. You never know. I'll never forget, we had a wonderful lady, she came into contact with us through our snack sacks. Her name was Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday was an atheist and an avowed atheist, but we loved on her child. And so she was like, I, I'll come. And she started coming on Sundays. What I didn't know is I was, I was preaching through the gospel of John expositionally. She was taking the recordings of the Sunday service. She would get one every week and she was playing them at the local atheist chapter. And then they were discussing them. Uh, how do you make that happen? I, that's, that's the Lord, right? And when I volunteered to come and have a conversation with them, they said no. But that was, that's, that's a different kind of thing, right? We never know the reaches. And we want to reach everyone that we can. And we want to explore all of those. But it cannot ever replace the power of the, the local church. And we don't want to miss that.